everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Mel, I'm an Uruguayan neuroscientist. I have this YouTube channel in which I interview scientists from different parts of the world. And today's guest is Dr. Alexander Harris. He is from the US. He's a professor at Columbia University. He's working with neural circuits and clinical psychology. He's both a medical doctor and has a PhD. And he's gonna tell us about this area of systems neuroscience. He's gonna talk about his research in depression and how you can translate this kind of research into the clinical aspect. So hi Alexander, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for giving your time for this. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So to start, tell us a bit about your story. As a teenager, I worked two jobs at the same time. I was a nurse and a research technician in a neuroscience laboratory. And I liked them both so much that I decided to dual career as a clinician scientist. I obtained my bachelor's at the University of Pennsylvania and an MD and PhD in neuroscience at the Einstein College of Medicine. My PhD was on really basic uh, neuroscience questions how neurons communicate with one another. When I was deciding on a clinical specialty, I realized that subtle problems in neural communication could lead to profound psychiatric disorders. So I did psychiatric residency training at Cornell in order to integrate my love for clinical work and neuroscience. And in which area did you specialize in? After residency, I was motivated to transition from the basic neuroscience questions I studied as a graduate student to something that could potentially advance treatment for patients with mental illness. So I did a fellowship at Columbia University with Josh Gordon in systems neuroscience. Systems neuroscience is the branch of neuroscience that asks how the brain produces experiences and behaviors often by identifying the specific brain circuit that governs a particular behavior. At the time, Josh was a practicing psychiatrist and at the forefront of applying systems neuroscience approaches to psychiatric disorders such as anxiety and schizophrenia. He was a role model of exactly the kind of psychiatric researcher that I wanted to be, and I joined his lab to apply a similar approach to understanding depression. Such a cool topic and important too. And within that, what do you do exactly? My basic approach is to record the electrical activity of circuits within the brain as mice engage in cognitive and emotional tasks such as solving a maze or pursuing rewards, and then figure out what changes in those circuits when normal behavior goes awry. Once we've identified circuit activity that corresponds to the behavior, we inhibit or activate those circuits using a technique called optogenetics, which allows us to control neurons using genetically encoded proteins that activate or inhibit neurons in response to a specific wavelength light that we deliver through little optic fibers directed to targeted areas of the brain. It's all kind of amazing when you step back and think about it. Indeed, I'm always very fascinated at both the biology that we are looking at, but also how many things and how complex things are we able to measure now and all these fancy new technologies that we have. Sometimes it seems like we are in a sci-fi novel or something. And could you tell us some cool results that you have had in your research or something that you would like to share with us about your work? Sure, I would love to. So one of the key symptoms of depression is decreased pursuit of pleasure we know that stressful experiences increase the risk of developing depression and even directly reduce reward seeking. But how stress impacts the circuits that govern reward seeking has remained unclear until now. To study this question, we recorded neural activity in the reward pathway as mice experience stress and pursued rewards. Mice like to roam free and find it psychologically stressful to be restrained. When we measured brain activity as they were restrained, we found that the neural activity in the nucleus accumbens, which is an important part of reward circuitry, started oscillating at 4 Hz. It was the most obvious result I've ever seen. As soon as the mice were restrained, you could see the nucleus accumbens activity go from no obvious organization into a rhythmic sine wave. It turns out that the magnitude of that oscillation predicted how much stress reduced reward seeking. And by using the optogenetic techniques I mentioned before, 
we were able to show that a small population of neurons, inhibitory neurons from a different part of the brain called the ventral tegmental area, were responsible for generating this brain wave during stress and for causing the subsequent disruption in reward seeking. Wow, it's so cool to be able to, to see it like that. And can you tell us some words about the importance then that, that we do this kind of research, right? I mean, this is really translatable into patients, into everyday betterment of certain conditions such as depression. For years, treatments for psychiatric disorders have been based on serendipitous discoveries. Antidepressants were discovered in the 1950s because patients being treated for tuberculosis with a new anti-TB medication showed increased enthusiasm for life. While this class of medications was a revolution, we still don't fully understand how these medications work, in part because we don't understand what is wrong with the brain that gives rise to the symptoms of depression. Studies like ours help bridge that gap and pave the way for designing specific treatments that target the circuits disrupted in mental disorders. Yes, totally. This field needs some modern techniques, some fine-tuning for sure. And I also would like to use this opportunity since you have already had a certain trajectory in science, you know, you're a professor, you do research in an area that you love, you went through all these stages in the, your career already. Do you have any tips, any piece of advice to younger researchers, to students that might be watching this video? The first bit of advice is to choose a career in science because you are passionate about it. Science can be a challenging career because funding is limited and there are often setbacks, so you need passion to make sure you continue to have fun and can get through those difficult times. The second bit of advice is related, and it is to have another career in your back pocket that you would also be happy with. Maybe teaching or consulting or scientific writing or in my case clinical work. I find that knowing you have other good options makes it possible to take more risks and stay focused on science without turning every grant application into an existential crisis. Finally, get a solid foundation in math and computer science. Those tools are so helpful across so many fields. I always find myself wanting more math and computer science skills. Yes, that's very good advice, so thank you very much. And those are all the questions that I have for you for today. So thank you so much for being here with us today, for giving time for this. It's really nice, the research that you are doing. And I hope that this area keeps growing and that keeps being translated into our lives. Thank you so much for having me and for doing the important science communication work that you do. And thank you for your attention. If you liked the video, I invite you to subscribe to the channel, to give a thumbs up, to leave a supporting comment. If you can and want to support financially, I also have a Patreon account. And with these resources, I'm able to work with people in Latin America to keep creating these videos or create even more. And I invite you to keep checking out the channel. Maybe there's some nice video that you missed and you would like to watch. And see you in the next video. Bye bye.